What has become of the hashtag not too young to run movement? A short while ago, many stakeholders in the Nigerian polity, including politicians and the civil society, had commended the initiative as a well thought out idea to make youth participation the only narrative going into the 2023 general election. Why has the fire been allowed to cool? And to what extent can the two biggest political parties in the land be held responsible for this situation? Where is the National Orientation Agency, which could have taken this idea by the scruff of the neck and created a smooth transition from the days of old and the promise of the future? Many questions, but for answers, we are now being joined by Hamzat Lawa, an anti-corruption activist and co-founder of Follow the Money, a social accountability initiative that comprises data analysts, journalists, activists, and students. Hamzat is also the chief executive of Connected Development Code, a non-governmental organization that is empowering marginalized communities in Africa with access to information on how to better engage their government for the implementation of public services. Good morning, Hamzat. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Good morning and good to have you on the show. Fantastic. All right, absolutely. Great to be with you guys. I'm interested in listening to your perspectives. <laughs> okay, so join us in, in sharing perspectives. What's happening to the youth? Uh, like we were saying, uh, the buzzword um, a few years ago uh, was the not too young to run. Um, but now it looks like the old guards are back. The usual suspects are back. There are at least two youth-oriented parties that we have not heard clearly from them. For somebody like your good self, who is in the mix of all this, what do you think is responsible? Or do you think that between um, April and May, when things will get heated up, we will see action uh, from the youth? Well, we've, we've seen action. Action has kick-started even since last year. Yes, not too young to run movement, mobilize and galvanize action and got the president to sign an amendment. And now we have the not too young to run act, which is a, a reduction act that has amended our constitution and give, give room for young people to run. See, this is politics, you know, politics is not showbiz. Politics is not tea party. And you don't expect the old guard to just hand over power. You know, a lot of work still has to go into the works. Mind you, after President Buhari signed the not too young to run uh, act. The political party became a big impediment to actualizing that vision. They came up with very expensive figures. So for you to buy party nomination form and expression of interest form, for presidency you have to have about 45 million naira. You know, so uh, when you're doing money politics, of course the old guards understand the game better. They have stolen our collective wealth and have impoverished uh, many, many Nigerians. And, and then they want to continue with this money politics. And this has also infected elections with vote buying and vote selling. But there have been a lot of youth aspirants. Yeah? A lot of young people are now aspirants. And I can call a few names. You know, you have Jude Ferrami, uh, you know, you have Minasara and Kanu. You have a lot of them who have now thrown their hats. You also have, you know, females who have thrown their scarf and say, come 2023, they want to be on the ballot. Uh, mind you, in this case, uh, you must come under a platform, so a political party, because we don't have independent candidacy yet in our constitution. So you must go under a platform uh, as, as an aspirant. And hopefully, after the primaries, uh, a lot of young people would emerge. But mind you, again, this primaries, the political party would decide which, uh, which system would they use? Would they be direct primary, indirect primary? And with the new constitutional amendment law, you now have consensual candidacy. So again, there's a lot of intriguing that's going to play out here. But I think that for youth to really emerge and play politics, we must do away with money, you know, money politics. But I'm really excited. You know why I'm excited? Today, we now have more of youth movements youth political movement rather than political party. And, and, and I think this is important in our political history and dynamics. A lot of, before now, we focus on, you know, political party, youth political party. But what youth movement would achieve, uh, to my understanding, is youth movement would mobilize and galvanize young people from all the political party. And then they can support young people that have emerged as candidates from 
every political party. So it's just to give them endorsement and mobilize vote for them. I have made commitment yesterday uh, at my symposium as I turn 35 that I'm going to play partisan politics as we go into 2023. I would publicly support candidates that stand and represent my vision, my ideals, and my principle and our collective principle about service to nation and to humanity and making Nigeria grow into prosperity. So, to, you know, three days ago in Kano, we launched the Green, uh, the Green Nigerian Movement. I know about the We Together Movement. You know, a lot of other youth movements are coming up. But what I believe is ahead of 2023, probably after the uh, primaries and, and the party, uh, you know, when the party converge. I believe that we would consolidate. And, and I say it's not enough. All these youth movements uh, are not enough. Green Nigerian movement, we together, they're not enough. We need much more movements because to mobilize votes. And, and for me, my commitment is, can we even get 50 million votes? Can we deliver 50, you know, at least 40 million votes? Because if you look at data from 2019, you know, over 80 million accredited uh, registered voters. But we got less than 30 million votes when you put together President Muhammad Buhari's vote and that of Alhaji Atikwa Bubakar. You know, that, that, so when you look at it statistically, less than 30% of voters turn out and cast their ballot. So this is unacceptable. So for me, I'm committed to say, let us mobilize electorate from the grassroots. And, and it's going to be a two-way approach, top, bottom, and bottom top. And let's meet, you know, at the middle, but we would... We would have a consensus. We would have a conversation. And our convener, Moses Siasa, we agree that before we take any decision, when we mobilize these 50 million dedicated votes, before we take decision on who we are endorsing and who we are mobilizing those votes for, we're going to have a conversation. We're all going to sit down. I would ensure that every member of the Green Nigeria movement is part of that decision-making process. So we're going to have a robust uh, debate and have disagreements, but disagreement to agree and agree that now is the time for youths and young people to work together to move Nigeria forward. See, it's not about even declaring interest to run for office. It's about looking at people who represent an idea. And for me, it's about intergenerational equity or dialogue. I'm not for, oh, let's retire all the old politicians. No. I'm for let's bring a new and build a new breed of politicians. And that's why I really like what Madame Obiese Kwesili is doing with the School of Politics. Let us build capacity. Let us also build integrity. Let us invest in human capital development of emerging young politicians. Let us also look at other politicians that represent our values, that represent Nigeria's collective interests, that are selfless in nature. See, I say selflessness because in 2019, if I had wanted to be in an elected position. I would have won election because at that time the momentum was high. We had a lot of goodwill. I had people calling me in my constituency to run. I had people saying they had you know, finance to give me to run an effective campaign. And I was really popular. But for us at the Not Too Young to Run movement, at that time we said we're nonpartisan and we still remain nonpartisan as a movement. And it's about selflessness. It's about changing the uh, political history and dynamics of what could become. And we believed and we delivered. Mind you, a lot of people thought it took less than uh, two and a half years. No, it took over a decade. Samson Itodo and his colleagues, when they first approached the National Assembly, they were relatively young. Uh, and and the, the, the lawmakers at that time laughed at them and, and told them to go and wait for their turn. What they did was to build alliance across the Nanja, like I say. They built alliance. They identified young people. They identified mobilizers. And that's why I joined them. Because they stood for the values and principles that I have identified with. And that is what we would do with the Green Nigerian Movement. And mobilize 40 million votes and deliver electoral promises to the Nigerian people. We must enjoy the dividends of democracy and change the dynamics of our political history and culture. All right, Hamzat. Um, very positive outlook you've painted for us there. But let's go back to this topic of money politics. In fact, as you, you, you were talking just now, you also mentioned that there were a number of people who would... Um, you know, offered to help you financially in support of your ambition. Let's talk about the financial implications and realities for political ambition for the youth. We were discussing this earlier before you joined the show. The reality is that it will still be their cost implications to it. And that's why we've seen a few campaigns come on and, and fall off. Is this a situation of not too young to run or not rich enough to, to run? What are, the, what are the realities on ground? The reality is money still plays a bigger role to sway elections. 
quality. But for me, I always, like I tell young people and the youth, what, what other thing do you have? Yes, you don't have money, but you have popularity. Every political party is set up to win election. And if you are a winnable and a viable candidate, people would want to finance your candidacy. Yes, the money bags would also want to ensure you become a puppet and, and play to their own tune because whoever pays the piper determines you know, the tune. So I always say, what do you bring to the table as, as a youth or as a young person? And, and it's no longer time to continue to agonize and complain. Yes, uh, I see there's a lot of conversation on, on social media, particularly Twitter. There are a lot of spaces conversation. Uh, but I always say that elections are not being heard on Twitter. You know, first, it starts from the word level. Do you even belong to a political party? Do you know your, national, your uh, organizing secretary at the ward level? Do you know your ward chairman? Do you know your ward secretary? OK, now the local government. Do you understand the local government structure? Who are the hems of affairs at the party level, from the ward to the local government, to the state, and the national level? Do you, are you a card-carrying member of a political party? What values, what values and what impact have you brought from the grassroots to the national level? Have you been identified? How have you shaped conversation and narrative? Because mind you, when political parties decide to undertake their convention and people that would inform delegates at the primaries are the excuse from the world to, this, to the local government and the state. So again, there are owners of political parties. You know, a lot of politicians would shy away from it. And a lot of young people who under, don't understand this dynamic would say, no, you know, uh, I have the electorate by my side. But you also need this officials, you know, these local governments and states and national structures, because there are people who are actually the financiers of these political parties, and they have an interest, and they also have a stake. These are people who, for, uh, you know, all the election circle, continue to fund political party activities from the world level to the national level. So these are the people we call the owners of political party. And those are the people that would decide and also instruct these delegates at the primary who they would vote for. Because come to, come to think of it, Nigeria is, you know, now India has overtook Nigeria as the poverty capital of the world. To buy, you know, the world form to, to become uh, part of the world structures, the least form is about 6,000 to 10,000 naira. If you go to the grassroots today, if you go to somewhere in Karana Muda in Zamfara State, nobody who is a regular farmer or a regular businessman, probably who's a recharge card or who is a Meshai, would want to bring out six to 10,000 Naira to buy nomination, expression of interest and nomination for, 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 to become a party esco. There are people who are the owners and who have a stake in political party who would buy the form for them and who would also nominate them and ensure that when they have congresses, these are the people who become the party esco. And these people, before they cast ballots in primaries or in any convention, they would first listen to the party owners and the people who have a stake in the party and people who have interest on who a match, both at the local government, the state, and the national level. So it's youth. You can see, I've observed a lot of meetings, you know, a lot of these meetings at the ward level. When I look at the statistics of people who are seated, they are not youth. Yes, you can say they are young, because when you look at political dynamics in Nigeria, you know, you still call a 45 or a 50, you know, 55-year-old man or woman a youth or young. You, can, you, you would not see anyone below 35 who is seated in this meeting at the world level. And when I interact with a lot of youths, and, and when I say youths in this, what I mean is 18 to 35. These are mobile up, you know, upward people. They, they just want to get a job. They, they want to be able to afford data, engage in social media, and just have a better lifestyle. But in politics, these are the people who decide who become candidates in political parties. So I think there's an opportunity here, and, and this is the narrative we're changing, and the, the dynamics we were trying to change. Yes, money plays a big role in today's Nigeria's political culture, uh, but I believe that if we're able to mobilize, organize, again, it's not time to agonize. You know, youths, young people, we've agonized a lot. We've complained a lot. Where has it got us? Nigeria is likely to become uh, on her knees. You know, in June, July, probably a lot of governors with, you know, with all this crisis of wealth, you know, with, with the queues and now no jet one for probably a lot of states, 
in the second quarter, going to the third quarter of the year, would not be able to pay salaries because we're still subsidizing heavily. So what, what this means is for you to change the trajectory of your country, you cannot shy away from politics because politics decides everything. So for a businessman, a regular businessman who does not invest or even engage in politics, with the current economic situation, a lot of businesses are bleeding. You know, a lot of people are stranded. I was stranded after our, the launch of our movement in Kanu for over 24 hours because all the flights were grounded. There was no fuel, you know, for us to fly. So, so you cannot shy away from politics at this time and this state of where we are. If we want to enjoy economic prosperity, we must engage in politics because politics decide everything. If you live or die, if you get a job, how much you're being taxed, or if you even get paid salary. All right. You know, I'd like you to expand on your analysis on the emergence of these usual suspects aspiring to become Nigeria's president. Now, you have said that you're not against it and that you are for the idea of bringing a new breed of politicians. Now, I'd like to know what strategies will foster this idea. How do we get a, a new breed of politicians if they are stifled by the usual suspects? So you see... There is a grower interest and concern on where we are and the state of Nigeria today. Uh, you know, dealing with insecurity, dealing with economic hardship and crisis, you know, there's high rate of unemployment. We've never, this is unprecedented. So there's high rate of concern and interest. You know, from even people in the diaspora, there's a lot of conversation, you know, currently taking place. And like I said before, it's about intergenerational equity and dialogue. But for me, it's about leading a movement and a conversation to get a lot of young people and young professionals, because uh, I sit on the Nigerian Young Professionals Board. And before now, as young professionals, we've shied away from politics. And that's why the Nigerian Young Professional is saying, let's even bring up a political arm of our initiative. And, and that's where the Green Nigeria Movement comes into place. And now we'll having conversation in the diaspora, or having conversation with other young professionals and say, see, we need to transition. You need to come into partisan politics. And we're not even discriminating. We're not saying, you know, we want to face out the older politician. We're not even discriminating against any political party. We'll say, become a card carry member of any political party of your choice, driven by your own personal conviction. Uh, because again, nation building is a role of everyone. Uh, and I believe that young professionals, business people, business women have a role to play. And, and I'm excited when you guys were having uh, your debates in the studio. You say you're seeing more women now. It's because of decades of advocacy to ensure uh, that we're able to break the barrier and ensure women are able to act actively participate and they're not discriminated upon. I hope that at some point we'll see more people with disability who are vying for office and who are actually winning elections and occupying public office. Because for me, it's about capacity. It's about integrity. It's about the values you stand for. But most importantly, it's about also serving people. Like I said yesterday, the fact that I'm I'm transitioning to partisan politics. It's about serving my country, and it is my right. It is my conviction and my lifelong dedication to serve my country, to serve people, because that is what would inform the kind of legacy we want to leave behind. And historians, when they talk and write about us, I believe they will be kind to us. So my sister, for me, is to work with various groups, you know, School of Politics, We Together Movement, and other like-minded people out there to have this conversation, but most important, to have a consensus and agree that we must mobilize 40 million votes, and this vote has to, you know, deliver on a presidential candidate. I, you know, I, I see today, I have influence, you know, I have power, I have social capital, you know. Yes, I don't have money, you know, I don't have financial capital, but I have social capital. And what this means is, with your goodwill, with your influence and social capital, which I enjoy both in Nigeria and Africa and across the world, is we can use it to bring about the kind of change we want to see. We can't say we want Nigeria to change, things are bad, and then we fold our arms, we continue to have conversation on space, we're not mobilizing at the grassroots. Each and every one of us is from one community. We're all from a ward. We all belong to a constituency. Do we even know who our representative in this constituency? Do we engage them? Or do we, you know, as you know, some young people will just call these people and ask for favor? No. Let us engage them. Let us even understand what their roles are 
in the separation of power and then hold them to account because I believe that is how we can build the kind of Nigeria we want to see and take her into prosperity. Nigeria is not yet a nation. With you and I, we can make Nigeria a striving nation. All right, Hamzat. Um, I will ask you two quick questions, you know, and I will appreciate if you can, you know, be um, quick about it. Uh, first, you made an allegation at the beginning of the interview uh, about the old guards and their propensity to uh, want to embezzle, you know, uh, you know, stole our money, you said. So I'm wondering, I, I, I guess you are saying this um, as the CEO of the Financial Integrity you know, um, NGO, follow the money. So in following the money, our money, Nigeria's money, what have you discovered? And how do you think that the uh, anti-corruption agencies, uh, EFCC, uh, ICPC, even SFU, uh, how have they fared uh, in the fight against corruption? And then secondly, uh, you said you would like to uh, galvanize at least about 40 million voters uh, this time around for 2023 elections. And my point to you is, if it turns out that um, the presidential candidate for at least two of the leading parties happen to be the old guards, people in their 70s, people who have attempted to run before people who have ruled here and there. Don't you think that that is enough um, reason for youth especially and many other people, you know, to think that was the point? You know, either of them will emerge anyway. And therefore, you are back to the 30, 35 percent of registered voters coming out to vote. If that happens, um, how do you think that will play out with the youth? And how will you personally feel if it turns out that people in their 70s, the same old faces, are the ones that will represent either the APC or the PDP or both of them. How will you, uh, uh, you know, what would you feel? How will you react to that? We'd follow the money and I think now it's a good opportunity to commend the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit's leadership and that of the Independent Corrupt Practices and other related offenses because I know that ICPC has now undertook, you know, uh, corruption fight particularly on constituency projects and they're recovering billions of Naira prosecuting uh, elected and public officials uh, and making sure that people at the grassroots enjoy the dividends of democracy. Uh, let me use COVID-19 as, as an example. So today you have, uh, people, you have people leading MDs who are not respecting the rule of law. So we write freedom of information requests uh, on how COVID-19 resources were mobilized and disbursed and who were the beneficiaries. As I speak to you, the last time the Accountant General of the Federation responded to me, only uh, com uh, admitted that they had uh, 35 billion and they've disbursed 30 billion. And at that time they had 5 billion Naira. Up till now, I, I responded to him and told him, can you give me a breakdown of this disbursement and the plan for the 5 billion? They haven't responded. They, the Accountant General of the Federation have not responded to me. I know that I also wrote to the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs. Where I need to also commend uh, them for responding, but also providing palliative to people during that difficult time. But I asked, how was this money disbursed? Can you give us access to this social register? On, or even tell us this point so that follow the money members, over 8,000 of them can undertake a social audit and inform the Nigerian people how this monies and taxpayers' money were being utilized. I also know that there was a private sector-led coalition called CACOVID. The last time we got data from them was they had about 37 billion. They had a target of about 45 to 50 billion, which is co-chaired by the governor of CBN and Alhaji Ali Kodangote, well-respected. And, and so they have also done some intervention, but we are saying, can you provide detail? And they made commitment that they were going to get an independent audit firm to audit their intervention for COVID-19. So this is just a few examples of the leakages and, and some of how corruption strive in our country, uh, you know, led by you know, people in government who are not adhering to the Freedom of Information Act. President Mohamed Buhari signed the Open Government Partnership, and they're also not uh, implementing and adhering to this commitment, both nationally and internationally. Now, talking about the old guards emerging um, in the two major political parties. Mind you, we don't only have two political parties in Nigeria, but yes, politically speaking, these are the two focused political parties. And I think that as we go into 2023, we need to deliberately not continue to amplify and give these political parties relevance. Let's 
look at other dynamics and let's also explore you know political parties that have not even given have not been given an opportunity to serve the nigerian people if and when candidates emerge we had committed that we're going to have dialogues with all of the political party and their candidates like i said we are not discriminatory we believe in equity you know we believe in fairness and everyone must have be given fair hearing. So we're going to have dialogues, political dialogue with these politicians. Call them the old guards, call them, you know, the money bags. We'll have conversation with them. And, and, you know, we're going to ask them, so what are your plans for youths? What are your plans for women? What are your plans for people with disability? And when I say plans, in your government, when you inform your government, when you appoint ministers, when you appoint heads of parastatals, uh, how many percent? are you going to dedicate to the youths, the women, and people with disability? Because, you know, people with disability brings up over 20 million, you know, elect, uh, eligible voters. And for me, and we will be deliberate, because when we say, you know, young people or youth, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, 18 to 40, 45, not the 50 and the 60. Again, we're going to give fair hearing. Uh, yes, maybe some of these guys who are 70 years and above or 60 years and above, might likely emerge because one, they've built political, uh, they've built, uh, you know, political support over the years. They've invested in politics and they have the money. You know, they have so much money to 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 sway the delegates. But when we have this, in, in uh, you know, when we have this conversation, if and when we're able to succeed, to have dedicated forty million votes, because see, politics is about numbers. If you have the numbers, and you can show realistically that you have the numbers. They, we will not be the one to even ask for a meeting. They will be the one coming to us to have these meetings and have this conversation. And I hope we will not get it wrong. But I, I think it's important to also state that I am not, a, I'm not scared to fail. I'm not afraid to fail because there's a lesson that will be learned. Either failure or success, there will be a lot of lessons to be learned. And 2023 is around the corner, but we still also have 2027. We have 2031. So I believe that we will continue to make progress, even if they are slow. But we believe that Nigeria deserves better, and Nigeria will be better in my time as Hamzat Lawad. Well, amen to that. Thank you very much, Hamzat, for joining Thank us you. on The Morning Show this morning.